dear guests, I would like to invite you to take a seat. We will have a new debate. We're within the cross-cultural uh, season of Romania France. My name is Sergio Mishkoyo, and I'm the director of International Cooperation of Babish Boy University in Cluj Napoca. I teach political science. And I'm very interested in European affairs, just like our two guests today. I will ask my two guests, Chloé Riddell, Jean-Antoine Emeric, to introduce themselves and talk about uh, the results of the elections. We will start from two premises. Firstly, uh, there was a large turnout for the EU elections. Even in the states where generally the voters' turnout for EU elections is quite low. So we can say that democracy uh, has had a resounding success. On the other hand, we have a European Parliament where we have three Eurosceptical uh, skeptical groups that have known a very uh, impressive evolution. Maybe three, these three groups will block in the future uh, certain uh, decisions in the, in the European Parliament. The result is that today's EU Parliament is quite heterogeneous. The issue is, do you think that the EU elections were a success of democracy or, on the contrary, they were facing they were facing an unprecedented uh, situation. So is it, was this a success? Uh, would the results be considered a success or um, a failure? I will give the floor to uh, Chloé. I'd like to introduce myself briefly. First of all, I am Chloé Riddell. I am a senior civil servant. But apart from this, I'm also very interested in what's going on in Romania. I try to write about what's going on here. I'm not trying to uh, lie to myself uh, when it comes to the European idea. However, when it comes to EU elections, I think the turnout was extraordinary, much bigger than in the previous years, but it was still lower than during the first EU elections, for instance, 1994. From my point of view, the result depicts a European landscape that is about to shift. It is highly fragmented, highly unstable, maybe even vulnerable. We're going through a transformation period. It's true that these transformations are different uh, according to the region, northern, eastern, southern, uh, western Europe, but we're talking about reshifting uh, landscapes, whether we speak of uh, the Christian or Democrat areas. Uh, there are extreme and radical political forces, such as uh, those in the northern countries. Uh, the Greens are not very present in the rest, uh, in, in many parts of Europe. And there are also populist voices that are characterized by um, a very particular political style. They, uh, they are somehow dichotomous. To sum up, I think this political context is more fragmented than before. In order for the landscape to be even more interesting, I think the stake that lies ahead is to reinvent the idea of Europe, but in a more complicated manner. There are several ideas about Europe. 
they have entered a sort of debate and struggle. There are the Eurosceptics that have uh, known a decrease uh, lately. Matteo Salvini, Viktor Orban, for instance, are highly critical when it comes to Europe. And they try to influence uh, all this construction, all this uh, European scaffolding from the inside. The European political landscape, therefore, is open to a debate. A debate that, it's, that is against the... In fact, the state today is to present an alternative Europe. A Europe that's alternative to that described by Orban or Salvini. I wouldn't want to use the term progress when I speak of Europe. But I would like to believe in a cooperation of European uh, peoples in the future so that they can come up with a new Europe. First, we need an existential objective, purpose, to ask ourselves why do we need cooperation at European level? And then we have to ask ourselves how we can reach that objective. Uh, does there have to be a cooperation between nations, for instance? And then we need a true political program. Ecology could be uh, one of those, but I wouldn't want to take over the talks, so I'll stop here. So there is this need to shake Europe from its, uh, at its very core. That's what I got from your speech. We should redefine what the basis of Europe is. Antoine, what is your perspective? Good day, everyone. I will briefly introduce myself. I am uh, Antoine Emeric. I am an anthropologist. I've been living in Romania for 15 years. And uh, that's about it, about myself. As for uh, the EU elections, from my perspective, we should lie the stress on national elections. In Romania, for instance, uh, we had a very obvious uh, situation. So we should analyze what happened in each and every state of the EU. As for the changes that we've seen in the political trends, well, we have to think if they will impact uh, the political future or not. But I don't think so, because Europe is a democratic system. Europe, in fact, is based on a treaty signed by all the member states, a constitutional treaty. For instance, Germany uh, did, not, did not join the common policy, but France expressed its, uh, expressed its wish to be part of it. So when we want to change Europe, some people will be against and some people will be for it. Germany, for instance, will be against it. The economic principles that have a political basis will be part of this or not. We don't know yet. This neoliberal construction creates a sort of opposition, a sort of distinction between populists on the one hand and neoliberals on the other hand. These political trends have something in common. For instance, Margaret Thatcher was a neoliberal. We have to take into account all these tension points. But we should be optimistic nonetheless at the same time. Do you mean to say that there are no solutions, that uh, Europe cannot be uh, reinvigorated uh, through negotiations and treaties and uh, through changing the fundamental philosophy that lies at its basis? I, I find that impossible, especially because 
euh, européen. Qu'est-ce que vous en pensez Germany is uh, one of the founding uh, states of the EU. So I think this issue is very, very relevant. We've come to dig to the core of the treaties and we talk about uh, economic um, the economic principles, the principle of free competition, for instance, says that the state cannot fund one industry or the other alone. Sans aucun fondement économique évident, ça a été fait au doigt mouillé. Donc, c'est vrai que de faire ça, de graver dans le marbre. Also, the treaty says that the deficit of a country cannot uh, exceed 3% of the GDP and that the national debt should, debt should not exceed 60%. But what is a constitution? A constitution provides uh, the rights of the citizens. So we need to maintain this very fine balance between human rights and popular choices. What is that? In fact, uh, popular voting. That means that through voting, people can change the situation. What does democracy mean? It means, uh, the, it means dissolving the benchmarks that make things uh, fixed. But the current situation shows us that instability is rampant. I think that it's very dangerous uh, that we have uh, institutionalized entire sectors. That's why the political debate today concerning uh, the monetary, monetary policy has led to a suffocation of democracies. There have always been such tendencies, but the EU has exaggerated them. To move away from a treaty, to exit a treaty unilaterally would be uh, crazy. So you I, leaving a treaty, uh, like it happened with Brexit, is a pure suicide. So for 10 years, the treaty meant a common agreement. However, this treaty does not have to be a fixed reality that can never be changed. And that's not what, what we should propose to our citizens. Well, let us ask ourselves if we could have dealt with the situation differently. Because Europe is not a nation state uh, that has a homogenous, a homogenous basis. So we have to find the common ground. And at first, this common ground were the, the economic principles, and based on these, we conceived a system that helped us redistribute wealth and resources. So this treaty is a historical compromise. Yes, well, what I'm doing is just an analysis. Uh, let's make it clear, I'm not trying to launch a political debate here. I don't think we can go beyond the treaties. In 1992, we voted the principles at Maastricht. Based on the Maastricht principles, we had an initiative of the fundamental rights, a charter for the for fundamental rights, but it remained a project. Yes, but many countries adopted this charter, not Romania, Bulgaria, because uh, citizens' rights are uh, breached in these countries. Well, let's talk about uh, labor rights. Let's think of the EU uh, from this perspective. We realize uh, 
that there is a standardization of this concept center uh, opposed to versus periphery. Uh, the former uh, head of the EU Commission, Jean Claude Juncker, is one of the architects of uh, embezzlement. So in Luxembourg, there, uh, Jean Claude Juncker built this method to increase uh, the GDP based on uh, tax evasion. So I don't know how, based on this logic, we can reach the opposite of it. So as you can see, the populists raise these points. And we cannot reproach them this fact because, after all, they are constant, they are coherent in their own ideology. These are the rules of the game for these politicians. Well, let us take a look at France. France has reached um, a very high uh, social progress. The current president wants to give up certain social rights. He's still thinking about them. He is the most neoliberal president that France has ever had. Nonetheless, France is still a country um, that's a special case as a neoliberal space. So the EU is a space of redistribution when it comes to social rights. And when we look at the different realities within the EU, we realize there is no consensus when it comes to defining the EU. We get the impression that everything works because the EU is based on social principles, but let us take a look at uh, Eastern Europe. These principles are not applied in Eastern Europe, or at least to a lesser extent. Yes, you're right. There are several visions, 28 different visions in within the EU, 28 European projects, and 28 types of voting and decisions. There is no European communication or no European public space for all these members. When you talk about uh, a difference in perception between uh, Eastern and Western Europe, I think it is fundamental. And I think the West uh, looks down on this difference, and it does so today as well. We have always underestimated the consequences of, a joint, of uh, new states joining the EU. What is the consequence of that? We have killed the initial idea of the EU, which was a federalist vision, a vision of a close-knit Europe. Once with the joining, uh, with the joining of the former um, communist countries, this vision became more fragmentary. The states showed that they needed to affirm themselves as nation states in order to be stable, and that they don't necessarily need a federal context; that they cannot adhere to typically Western um, values. Just think about it: the principles and values of uh, Western, uh, of Eastern and Central Europe did not exist when the EU was founded or during the Maastricht, Maastricht Treaty. And when these new states joined the EU, simply signed the treaty without having any power of changing uh, what, the, what the treaty said. We can see a new vision of Orban, for instance, and Kaczynski that countervails uh, the Western vision. Central Europe tries to countervail the idea of Europe. It tries to conceive a counter model, somewhere in between the Russian and the Western model. There are so many consequences of this. 
because that's what we have to build uh, our future Europe on. Uh, the after the the idea of a Europe that's ever closer is an idea that we have to give up. What lies at the basis of the EU? The common, common market. So we opened the, the market, we have the four types of movements, uh, free movements of capital, of people, and so on and so forth. But we no longer have this kind of leverage. And that is because there is no interest from countries such as those you mentioned, uh, the tax havens, so there's no interest for these countries to impose social rights. The only thing that's common to these countries is space and the internal market. Let us not criticize the European market because it can be an opportunity of facing globalization. The European market will allow us to protect ourselves against our competitors. Our market is 500 million consumers. This is a rich market based on certain social norms that we have to abide by. So let us focus on our common market and give up uh, the ideas we had back when we were fewer, when we were thinking of a federal Europe, a very united Europe. No, that can no longer hold up. Nation states continue to exist and they have to be respected. How can we impose environmental values, for example, on others when these values aren't the same all over Europe? Climate change pays, um, plays a very important role in Nordic countries, but in Romania or in Bulgaria, such issues aren't really fundamental. There aren't really norms when it comes to social norms. It's the same, but we still have to struggle. We still have to agree, all 28 member states. This is our power that we, 28, agree together on something. It would be mm, easier to agree on environmental norms. We are all interested in having a better life. So if we talk to people about a green environment and what is important for their children as well, I think that we will be successful and reach an agreement among the 28 member states. I don't know what your approach is, for example, when it comes uh, to legislation for NGOs, but there should be a cohesion so that we can impose common uh, norms on others. Antoine, do you think it is possible in the future to reach a consensus? When we're talking about environmental, social norms, can the European Union play an active role on the international market, just of the BRICS states? I would like to see that. I would like to see a less polluted environment. However, there are several um, factors that have to be considered. There should be integration and true solidarity, which is unfortunately lacking in uh, Europe today. I'm thinking of the Greeks, for example. Everyone in, is interested only on their little portion. Peoples are different. There is no truly European people. And federalism is a utopia in my perspective. At one point, there was a proposal. However, this was impossible to implement and is still impossible to implement. 
maybe on a longer run, we sh will be able to do this, to impose certain texts on, on, on products, to, to have certain texts on products that do not adhere to environmental norms. And this would help us uh, tackle with uh, certain environmental issues. The same could apply in ecology. We do have certain tools at our disposal. The issue is how can we have a transition from today's reality and what towards what we want to have in the future. I think there is a clash between generations, a traditional generation and the newer one that, that is uh, open to technology. In Japan, for example, everything is running smoothly from a technological point of view, but it seems we have reached the end of history when we, are, we look at the human component of, of it. Social movements uh, have uh, started to rise, and even even in Romania, I'm thinking of uh, Rosia Montana, of the social movement to save it. But in the current institutional framework, it is difficult to find consensus. On the long run, however, I actually can provide you with a tool. I can, however, offer you scenarios. You talked about taxes, and we were talking about an environmental tax. Uh, whenever people hear about such a tax, they uh, are no longer green. They change their perspective. This is what happened in uh, France as well. Just look at the movement of the yellow vests. So how can we impose taxes for products that pollute the environment and also get the support of the people? What can we do when citizens do not agree with the principle behind imposing such taxes? What if they're not ready to face a green revolution because this would impact uh, them. They would lose a lot of uh, advantages that they now have, technological advantages. I didn't really quite understand your suggestion. I do agree when you were talking about the transfer, the transition. For example, Germany will never embrace uh, anyone and everyone. I do think that solidarity is a national issue. Maybe we should talk about what is next. We cannot just deconstruct everything. We're talking about the common market. This is a pillar of the European Union. And it doesn't really cost us a lot. We can talk about a transfer, of a financial transfer. Recently, uh, electronic fishing, electric fishing, uh, uh, fishing uh, through electric means was uh, forbidden. Uh, talking about fish, uh, deep waters fishing. This was forbidden. Why? Because we are uh, going towards a zero waste continent, eliminating plastic. And this is how, when we compare ourselves to China, for example, we're in a situation of unfair competition. If we were to eliminate all plastic, uh, how could we actually find an alternative solution so that we could actually compete on the market. Maybe this is not a project for, for the next uh, period on the short uh, run. But at least when it comes to communication and dialogue, there is a need for measures. We need debates. We shouldn't uh, have a fatalistic uh, approach. We shouldn't think that there's nothing that we 
can do about these issues. You asked me, are there um, social movements, for example, against the CO2 tax or other similar taxes? I wouldn't like to comment on all these issues. There are a lot of downsides uh, of the implementation of such environmental measures. But we should not forget how important it is to try to preserve our quality of life. And Europe uh, seems to be a champion when it comes uh, to ecology, environmentalist uh, measures by the rich against the poor. Northern states are indeed developed uh, in terms of uh, ecology, environmental, tackling environmental issues. All this talk about a transition towards a greener city is, of course, not an isolated issue independent from industry. Will we ever manage to have a popular environmental movement so that the broad public is sensitive, uh, sensitive to these issues? When talking about the yellow vests, for example, uh, the pro protesters um, do not represent uh, society as a whole. Uh, we are talking about uh, people from underprivileged communities. So imposing new taxes, this is something unacceptable. We should not forget that all the talks that uh, instigate towards uh, class struggle have become e even more stronger. So this is the source of the conflict, a conflict that France is faced with. What you have seen in France in the past uh, several months uh, can be applied to Europe and is very important to Europe, even more important than the European elections. So do you think we should concentrate on protesting? Because these protests are a clearer indication of the road we are taking as a continent? Is this what you are saying? Historically speaking, France has a different way of conceiving state and society and the connection between the two. Let's raise a question. Can the social state play an important role again? Isn't this the true and real solution? Without this instability we're currently facing in France, we cannot progress. We need social security, minimal social security. I'm talking uh, about uh, health-related minimum security. And what is the answer of Eastern countries to this need? A populist answer. People try to build groups uh, and solidarity, but this solidarity fades away in the market. And finally, all these forces will be beyond control. So what are you trying to say? That democracy can only be populist? If it is highly institutionalized, will it no longer work? No, that's not what I mean. What I mean to say is that unless we bring a democratic answer to ensure equality between people, I'm not talking about uh, complete equality, people will go looking for other answers. There are these uh, political entrepreneurs who uh, work with racist answers. I'll give you an example, the example of drivers in France. Uh, 
if immigrants come to France from Estonia or other countries, French uh, drivers will say, oh, so they came here to sell our jobs. And this is what we need to uh, tell our government. Through this kind of policies, you create impossible situations. Going back to the EU uh, election results, did the EU leaders get the message, you think? Because the message is very important. Let's see what this message was. Was it understood? Did it sink in? Will this message allow for reforming of the situation without destroying certain rights that have already been gained, such as the common market? Will the situation be controllable? Can we regain the political and social connection? Was the message understood by the leaders? Or is this just a short-term victory of non-populist sides? We'll see later what kind of alliances will come about between Lib Dems, uh, Greens, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, looking at the election results, we can say that uh, our concern was in vain. By analyzing the protests, uh, which are ever more numerous, and by analyzing the EU results, do you think there is a message indeed and that this message was understood by the EU leaders? I don't know. I don't know if there is a message and if it was understood, the future will tell. As for the nature of populism, I think this is a reflex a reaction to a suffocating a, a tendency a suffocation tendency, which is due to globalization, due to the globalization, we have two situations that lead to a political impossibility. And we've seen this in economic and political debates. They simply went astray. On the other hand, we've seen that nation states apply certain measures that are imposed on them by uh, supranational institutions. And the states are forced to liberalize policies in order to stay competitive. These policies are imposed from above. This uh, authoritarianism coming from above comes into conflict, conflict with the needs of the average person. So that's where the conflict and the struggle lies. And the state is caught between these two tendencies. This is uh, an explanation for populism, in my view. It is a wish to take control, to take back control. Of course, uh, due to globalization and the negative effects of globalization, whether we talk about neoliberal policies or uh, migration waves. I think populism in itself is a message saying we want to take control back. Who are the representatives of populism? Matteo Salvini, for instance, who closes down uh, Italian uh, ports and no, no longer allows migrants to come into the country. This is a very concrete measure. So what does Salvini say? We've taken control back. What he has done will not completely change the Italian uh, situation, but his image and his measures give people the impression that they can control their own destiny again. I think it's a matter of urgency for leaders to try to understand that we need to come up with the measures 
that correlate the economic and the political environment. We need to recreate the internal market that can countervail the global market. We need to redesign uh, our borders. The EU no longer has to be a permanent show and stage where populists can uh, uh, scream from the top of their lungs about things but do nothing at all. We do need to act. We need to have the power to act. So how would you define this? How could we do that uh, by going back to national democracy? Don't you think there could be a pan-European, trans-European uh, progressive populism that could do all this at European level and not at national level? This vision would go hand in hand with the idea that you have just expressed, namely that it would create a space to countervail the Chinese or American space. If there were a common public opinion, a European people to ask certain rights and certain political measures, then this would lead to the construction of, uh, of an economy within a political space. Yes, as long as there is no European democracy, as long as there is no uh, European political debate, democracy has to be strengthened at national level. But the debates we're seeing now are teeming with populism. We're caught in a gray area. Public sectors uh, were federalized by the EU with no consequence at all, with no visible consequence. I believe we should publicly debate at European level these issues. We need to have this capacity. And at the same time, we need to come up with solutions at national democracy level. That doesn't mean to say we'll go back to nationalism or war. It's just about a new dialogue that needs to be reignited. Aren't we running the risk that each country follow the model, uh, the example of uh, Orban's Hungary or Salvini's Italy? Or isn't there the risk of going back to a state uh, sovereignties that move away from the common European project and that will lead to its uh, fragility? We could ask this question from a philosophical point of view. Is it better? Would it be better this way or is it better the way it is today? For sure, we need to ask questions about the two scenarios, the current one and what could happen in the future. I don't know if we can overcome this opposition between national and European sovereignty. We could envision collaborations and close communication based on democratic structures. Maybe our debate until now was rather shallow. I, maybe we could uh, start off from the environmental issues and try to learn from Hungary. There are students opposing elites, so many situations that could be just the beginning of our debate. We shouldn't only talk in uh, universities, but bring debate in society within citizens. And we should be thinking of reaching a consensus in the next years. Maybe we can uh, now get the public's reaction. What do you think about this? Maybe you have a common uh, point of view or a different one?
I would like to go back to what uh, Chloe Riedel was saying, talking about the differences in perspectives uh, between Europe Eastern Europe and Western Europe. Yesterday, we launched a debate. We had a debate called decolonization of Eastern Europe. Very interesting debate, as you can imagine, from the title. Certain speakers, uh, and I'm thinking here about uh, Veda Popovic, uh, was uh, criticizing uh, white Europe. Europe that, in her perspective, is too white. She was trying to say, actually, that uh, Western Europe imposed certain standards on uh, Eastern Europe, uh, choking uh, states in Eastern Europe. Do you feel the same, especially since you are a Romanian citizen? And then Another idea that was presented yesterday, how did we uh, switch from communism to this wild, uh, chaotic ca capitalism? Could there be a rebirth of communism that would be brought about by the youth? I'd like to hear your opinions. As I was saying, both uh, were uh, ideas that were presented yesterday in uh, the different debates. I couldn't give you a definition of Europe uh, in terms of social relations. Romania and France are two are on two different grounds. European Union has been seen as a melting pot of civilizations. And it seems that it has become a space for elites uh, that rip off people. European Union itself will always have this elitist nature. And Romania was uh, actually maybe m even more enthusiastic about the idea of European Union than other states. Yeah, it would be nice to give you some figures. Maybe Sedju could uh, help me. So we need to basically understand from a local point of view that Europe is in the middle of a debate which is not really political. Behind this uh, debate, we have longer discussions taking place. For example, what was the influence of the Americans who saved us ever after the Second World War? Was what, what was the influence of Russia on Europe? And so on. When you are at the crossroads, at the intersection between two empires, uh, you switch between the two. I remember I uh, met a Bulgarian-Polish couple once. The couple was uh, talking about the Russian Tsar. The Bulgarian was saying, ah, the Tsar was great. And the Polish almost uh, went berserk. So you can imagine uh, what differences uh, there can be when it comes to perspectives. Yes, so there are tendencies that can have an echo even in African uh, countries, for example. It seems in Romania that we are facing a nationalist uprising, so to say. We want Europe's head. We see the European Union as the scapegoat of the whole catastrophe. 3.5 million Romanians left Romania for other countries.
countries of the EU, especially uh, Western Europe. Everything that they experience there seems to them to be more interesting than what they left behind. Romanians living uh, in Western Europe uh, seem to adhere to the idea of European Union, of being in love. If we were to compare our elite with the one in Brussels, we could say uh, these are two different worlds, a, na a world of nationalism, of Ceausescu. On the one hand, although um, the youth have not really managed to truly experience this, so they can't really feel nostalgia. And on the other hand, we have a different world, which is very limited, constrained. And then people ask themselves, what will save us? So we have people who are nostalgic when it comes to the past, and others who are more focused on the future. Let's go ahead and make progress. You have two very different perspectives. We could also add that being uh, left-wing in Romania is seen as a as something uh, belonging to the past, as uh, being uh, a fan of Ceausescu or of uh, communism. Are there any other questions in the room? There was a question in, in the room regarding white Europe, racial Europe. I wanted to go back to certain topics that we tackled with uh, yesterday uh, within this uh, roundtable discussion of uh, de decolonialism in Eastern Europe. Uh, there was a young Romanian who had a very critical approach and stance towards uh, white Europe that she completely refused. What do you think about these perspectives? I think uh, this is a niche phenomena. It's just a minority. I don't think that everybody believes that Europe is capitalist, uh, belonging to the white. If uh, Orban's vision, the vision of a white uh, and Christian Europe goes smoothly, then the message reaches the people. For example, here in Romania, 89% of the people are Christian. Also in Hungary, the majority is Christian. So what we can see in Eastern Europe is that uh, population in itself is homogenous and is prone to rejecting uh, migration waves. We can notice in Hungary, for example, what is going on, a very interesting phenomena. Hungarians do welcome Romanian migrants, but they do not welcome at all migrants from the Middle East. They are against uh, Islam, but they do accept or are tolerant to other migrants. Yes, we have the example of two states, uh, Poland on one hand and Romania, for example. I'd like to highlight that our country is uh, defined uh, by its uh, migration waves towards Western Europe. However, we are against uh, rights uh, given to Syrian refugees. 
in Hungary, for example, there, there was uh, this fear that migrants would uh, pass uh, through Serbia and reach uh, the borders of uh, Hungary. It's, it is a totally different perspective as in Germany. You in Romania, for example, are open to migrants to, from the Ukraine, but are less open towards migrants from other countries. I think we as Romanians are, have a, a moderate approach. I think we are the most balanced country when it comes to uh, Muslim refugees coming to Europe. Uh, we are less frightened compared to other states. Maybe this also has to do with our history. We were always at the crossroads between history. We were at the periphery uh, of the Ottoman Empire. In Cluj, you can also uh, experience this uh, heritage that we have in terms of culture. So our lens when it comes to mid the Middle East is, uh, is different than in other countries, we are more balanced. I think this is an exaggeration. When I think of the echo of yesterday talks, there is something that I really like to add. We saw how communism destroyed everything uh, when we think of Serbia, of Bulgar Bulgaria, for example. However, although it seemed that communism destroyed everything, there were people from Serbia, for example, uh, who were uh, trading in Romania, in Constanza, in communist times. Something interesting, you were open towards migrants. However, when the Syrians uh, took, the, took the train to go to Hungary, they didn't stop in Romania. I find it funny. So I think this is not a political issue, and this should not be an issue for debate, basically. As long as we have neighbors, we do have to think about uh, migration. I would like to add something to what you said. And I would like to mention that, indeed, I don't believe that Romanians fear migrants. But I did hear a lot of Romanians say that they feared uh, the future of France. because they went to Paris and there they saw a lot of Arabs and a lot of uh, black people. This type of discourse uh, draws on the far right, the far right in France. So in fact, uh, r the Romanian discourse uh, about migration reflects the situation in France, not the situation in Romania. Yes, there is this sort of perception and open openness towards this kind of uh, anti-migrant discourse. And Eastern Europeans are shocked when they go to Western Europe and see this great variety of people and the situation at home is completely different from that. Uh, their countries are more, more homogenous than Western Europe. Even so, I've noticed that during the migration crisis, public opinion, even in countries such as Hungary and Poland, in fact favored the reception of migrants and the welcoming of migrants as opposed to politicians whose discourse was very rough against uh, the migration wave.
politicians opposed uh, cosmopolitan reality and uh, the EU, thinking that the national state would be destroyed because of migration. This type of discourse did not work in Romania, but it worked in a country such as Slovakia. It almost caught on in Slovakia. I think we're approaching the end of this panel. So let's just say something about about uh, the future of EU leaders after the EU elections. I would like your opinions on that. And when we see that EU institutions uh, need consensus. So if I were to conclude, I would say that I think a lack of trust is rampant, especially young people do not trust political parties. That's why they prefer setting up an organization or association. People just run away from political parties. But the possibility of changing things belongs to political parties and institutions, which is why we have to take part in elections. It's not enough to uh, just be part of our small group of friends or uh, of our association. We need to get, our, get involved in uh, politics again. When I see people who get involved in uh, the party called Momentum that received 10% in the EU elections, well, that makes me hopeful. We need to take on this radical discourse of change within the institutional frame. We need to take on action and we need to act at an institutional and political level. Uh, I would like to say that political parties in Eastern Europe will make alliances with uh, the popular party uh, whose representative is Macron in the West. I would just uh, like to add a story to this. My uncle lived in Chad for many years and his children were born there. The youngest child lived for two years in Chad. And when she got uh, to France and saw that people were white, she was terrorized by this crowd of white-faced people because uh, her mother was black, his father was uh, not quite white, so she was shocked. So how do, how do we see diversity? I think it depends on our perspective. That's what I meant to say. If we talk about Romania, then the discourse gets uh, more inflated when we talk about sexual orientation. As for uh, migration uh, discourse, Romania doesn't really have a very strong stance. But as for uh, uh, sexual orientation, Romania has a strong stance. Uh, I would like to thank our guest today, and I hope that these debates will go on. Thank you very much for participating. Have a good evening.